This is the Birds of Feather, Spark, Zeppelin, Data Science. Uh, our speakers, you guys could sit down on these chairs, I yeah. If Kinchana, if you want to join, uh, and by the way, so it's a birds of feather. It's very informal. Uh, so if you want to come a little bit closer, we're generally if you know we could unhook these seats, would make a circle, but it's a um, uh, highly a uh, little bit difficult. So, so we, we have we have uh, people from Horton, people from IBM, uh, and uh, I'll just pass the microphone for them to introduce yourself and, uh, and just you know briefly just talk about you know what you're doing. And then basically any question goes. So if you're having some difficulties, some, you know, whatever it is that you're struggling with that hasn't been answered at one of the sessions previously, this is the time. And then of course, um, towards the end, if you just want to talk a little bit about the vision, where we're going, uh, and a few other comments. So I have another microphone. If for some reason you're sitting uh, far back and not and you're not loud enough, but with that, I'll pass in the microphone. Hello, my name is Ying Chen. I'm from IBM. I work in the data science local uh, integration with Hadoop systems. Um, hi, this is uh, Samitra. I'm on the product management side of Hortonworks. Hi, uh, my name is Sriram Srinasan. I work on, uh, I, I work at IBM. I work on a couple of products. One of them was just announced. It's called IBM Cloud Private for Data. And the second one is uh, Data Science Experience. Hey, I'm Kanchana Padmanabhan from IBM. I am one of the engineering managers, uh, primarily manage DSX uh, with focus on the Hadoop integration. Great, yeah, so um, with that, um, does anybody have first any kind of question that goes, whether it's the, you know data science, whether it's the Hadoop stack, where we're going, what are tooling, um, anybody to start with? It's just super informal, so any question really goes. If you have a question, that's fantastic. Right, let's get it started. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, I just wanted to understand, um, you know, um, what your roles are. You know, can I get a show of hands for um, data scientists or aspiring data scientists, machine learning practitioners? Right. Okay. Cool. Um, how about uh, data engineers, um, people who who build ETL? Okay. Cool. And uh, and um, how about folks who work on um, analytics or operation BI okay. and um, admins, system admins, IT admins, operators? operators. Okay, um, execs, you know. Okay. Cool. <laughs> it's informal, so please go ahead. My name is uh, Pavan Surapanini. I'm from Cox Communications. Um, at Cox, we are probably in the third year of our uh, Hadoop journey. Uh, we were priorly very big on uh, Informatica and Oracle. So we have a very big uh, analytics practice on our Exadata platform using SAS. So there are a lot of uh, models that are built on SAS. And our analytics community is right now trying to transform and use Hadoop. So they are using a lot of different technologies, right? Uh, and recently, uh, they are trying to use Zeppelin. Uh, we have Zeppelin. We are running Zeppelin 0.7. And they are running to a lot of performance issues in the sense, you know, um, I mean, we are, our clusters, I know, are appropriately scaled. We don't think it is an issue with scaling our nodes. But what we think they are doing is, instead of using Zeppelin as a um, exploratory tool, which I think you know you need to validate my assumption. I'm thinking Zeppelin should be mostly used as an exploratory tool. Instead of using Zeppelin as an exploratory tool, they are trying to just munch lots of data, maybe you know even terabytes of data, and trying to you know visualize it at the same point and trying to do analysis at the same point. My question is, you know, what are some of the parameters that we need to use when we are trying to do data science on Zeppelin? be it using models and even visualization at the same time. Um, again, I'm going to ask a question. So Zeppelin in front of Libby, is that how you're using it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, 
I, I don't know the answer, but I think uh, you guys can take a shot at it. Sure. Uh, I think um, you asked the right question, right? We, we need to make sure that all the workload happens on the Hadoop cluster, and we are not, by mistake, bringing things onto the browser, if you will, or to the Zeppelin process itself. So as long as you're using Livy to push it down to a Spark cluster, that's good. Um, and um, you know, when you do visualizations, obviously, uh, you're looking at aggregations and samples. Yeah. So the first <coughs> culprit, I would think, is to see if you're accessing a lot of data into the Zeppelin process, yeah. and that needs to be avoided. Uh, but I'm assuming you're using Spark or some other mechanism. To, okay. Okay. So that's probably where we. And what HDP version you are on? HDP two dot Two six four and the Spark version is two dot two. Okay. Yes. So we are using Spark. One of the reasons, one of the issues. Most of the users think there are also issues with Spark within the Hover cluster. Okay. And they started using GitHub. I and see. No, you know all of these new tools. You know, they're okay. Not going to solve the problem. And my question is more around, you know, are there certain limits or parameters? Yeah, got it. I, I don't have the answer to it, but what I can do is um, I can follow up with you. You're probably a customer of ours. Yeah. Who's your SC? Uh, John, John Plato. John Plato, okay. Do you mind if I take your, uh, sure. so I can follow up with him? Sure. So, so um, in the audience, have you had um, uh, experience or do you have best practices tips to share in, uh, with Zeppelin especially? Have you? Have you encountered the same kind of issue where even though you're using Livy and pushing down to the Spark, um, you haven't seen the performance that you've expected? Yeah, other question I have is, how many of you are using Zeppelin, Jupyter? Can I sort of raise, get a raise of hand, like how many are using Zeppelin today? And how many are using Jupyter? Okay. Our studio, <laughs> please. Yeah, yeah. You can. I can. Yeah. And how many ever looking at IBM DSX? How, how many of you tried IBM DSX today at one of my uh, crash courses? Ah, awesome. Did you guys like it? It, it, it's, it can be open about it. <laughs> <laughs> So the question was about model management, yeah. right? And this this was uh, the crash course was with uh, one one three. Science crash course today and uh, one yesterday. Course, but today was about the data science and uh, the model management. Right, model but it was version one point one three, right? One point three. Yep. Okay. So what we've done in the next version that's already out there is um, we we provide a capability that's called um, model management and deployment. So the focus is more on scaling out deployments. So you can take a model and you can say expose it as a, as a web service. Essentially expose the scoring endpoint. And then you can also say that this model is, is a very popular model or there are many, many concurrent requests and you need a latency, sub-second latency or maybe 60 to 70 milliseconds. So what we help you do is to take, um, to enable load balancing. You can um, scale up the replicas that are associated with that server, all with a click of a button. So now you have a scoring service for that model. The model is also preloaded into memory, so there's no I/O um, overhead. And you, if you have multiple copies of that server running, all load balance, you get back a very high-performant request. Are you also doing like version control and have like a metadata type of uh, management? Yeah, exactly. So. Okay. Um, so we also realize that people have multiple versions of these models, and you may want to replace a model in production. So the load balancing actually helps, because what we do is we do a rolling upgrade. So when you update a version of the model, you know, they continue to, some of the servers continue to serve until they all get replaced with a new version of the model. And are you doing something similar to like SPSS model and MyFi where you have a graphical 
Yeah, so uh, actually SPSS modeler is available on top of da data science experience local. Um, so it's it's the same, almost the same kind of capability that you have with SPSS modeler on your desktop. Yeah, uh, so uh, SPSS, is, you know, it's it's been renovated. It has new characteristics. You know, it has new nodes, and uh, it enables for visual modeling. But you can also take um, an SPSS flow, whether it generates a model or not. It's a it's a DAG, right? So you you can take the DAG and schedule it for execution on a continuous basis or on a daily basis. So that those are kind of additional things that came on top of the same platform. So I was kind of curious on uh, how does the modeling lifecycle looks like uh, when uh, when we are moving data scientists from traditional tools to Zeppelin. Are there any do's and don'ts, and are there any guidelines? Uh, I don't know how to answer that because um, I'm not a data scientist. <laughs> um, but I can try to give you my views of what uh, people have done. So f for example, it really depends on the on, on the on the framework, right? So, Zeppelin works very very well with Spark, right? So if you're if you're well versed at, uh, with Spark and Spark ML, then you'll find it very easy to use uh, a Zeppelin. And of course, you have um, other capabilities too in Zeppelin to visualize some of your um, HDFS data or you know with with the um, percent SQL capability, you can actually do some SQL visualization, all of that. So it helps you visualize. And it helps you adopt uh, Spark ML very well. Right? Having said that, we've also seen people use uh, Livy and Spark, but instead of using Spark ML, use TensorFlow. So if you are um, if you are a, a user who's been using, let's say, a visual drag and drop modeling tool like SPSS, you may find it a little awkward uh, because it's more of an interactive, almost like a programming experience. Um, so it'll take a while to get used to. And uh, but if you are a uh, if you are more of a say a Python or Scala programmer, then you'll find it a lot easier to adopt. And you can actually do things in a very um, I feel that you can do it in a highly interactive yet in a step by step manner. And you can do certain uh, changes. And the best part is you can actually share things and publish things very easily. Uh, so that gives you a lot of power, but it at the expense of uh, say drag and drop um, kind of things that SPSS provides. So Thank it, you. It, it really depends on the data scientists. We kind of roughly categorize data scientists as coders and clickers. Um, I would say mostly Zeppelin appeals to coders in that sense. Wouldn't you say that? No more questions? It's only like six. <laughs> um, maybe I can ask a question. So how many of are you using Anaconda today? OK. Yeah, how about other platforms? And what do you like, what do you don't like about it? Yeah. I mean, if you want to talk about it, right, what do you like about It'll help us learn from your experience too. You know, take a shot. How about H2O? <laughs> like, uh, how many of you are using H2O? Planning to use. Planning to use. Do you want to talk about uh, Anaconda? <laughs> we are so uh, signed you up. <laughs> <laughs> well, Anaconda is I mean, it's easy to implement. I mean, this, okay. I mean, it's mostly what I've used is just. Python script. Python script. Writing in the library is easy to for me to visualize, which is what I like is I like to see my uh, well this one Anaconda doesn't have the workflow like like um, SPSS does, which I want to see is being able to switch between the view, right? If I can have a notebook where I can have the just the script and configure my hyperparameter whatever I need, but then have to visualize workflow so I can see how I can transform stuff or how I go from transform to right, ingest to transform to predict or train like train to predict. So I want to see both sides of the world and be able to switch between. I was wondering if I can do that, so, and that's why I asked that. But on the Anaconda side, I think 
Um, I mean, it's just easy for me to just visualize the results right away. And I think Zeppelin is, is doing the same thing. Let me see. And, and then whichever one has more capability over time, I think like Zeppelin with the multiple um, translator, mm -hmm. that's definitely something that's great. And um, I mean, it's just the easiest way for me to productionize all these different things that I do. That, that I think that will help speed up the, the movement, I think, right? And you're using the community version or the paid version of the content? I'm just on a free version. Right free now. version, yeah. Okay. yeah. How many of you are using the Anaconda paid version? Enterprise. Oh, Enterprise, yeah, sorry. OK. So, uh, I have a follow-up uh, question. So when you say you're using Anaconda, right, um, are you using their Conda environments and distributions and packages? Or are you using their, um, uh, let's say, their version of the Jupyter environment, Jupyter Lab? Yeah, usually I just set up the virtual environment and I just add the, the libraries I need, right? The TensorFlow is basically the TensorFlow okay. Claros so the one that usually that's, that's the case that we, people okay. use. And then we just add, it, add them as needed, I think. Um, but um, it's, I mean, it's for, for data scientists just to test out things, all the libraries to be included is always best. But then you want to just be able to take it off when, when you don't need it overall okay. when you want to deploy it. So, so it's just right. a matter of what is the best way. I think for us right now, it's still in the, kind of in the learning process. So I would say the more library that has already come with it, great. Uh, but then how do we strip, strip it after it is done or when you're ready to send it to the production pipeline? Uh, I think that's just something we have to discuss with the DevOps team or whoever is working on that side. So, so f from a DSX perspective, we actually include a couple of different versions of Anaconda. One that's focused on Python 2.7 and another one, Python 3.5. Um, and like you said, uh, we include the full Anaconda distribution as well as some additional libraries that we've found users wanted. So what, what we also do is we kind of package it as a Docker image. So it makes it easier to replace, extend, you know, as well as replicate. So if you have, if you have a Docker image that you're using in your dev cycle, you can actually uh, use that exact same image. Uh, we call those environments in DSX in, um, in your t staging or in, even in your production. So when you um, remember I, I talked about a model that is exposed as a scoring ser service. It could be actually a, a script too. You, know, you, can, you can expose your script that's using Anaconda that is loading a model. That too can be exposed. But essentially that model scoring service runs inside an Anaconda container or a container that includes Anaconda. And it all presets a Conda environment. Mm -hmm. So that way, we can exactly replicate what was done when the model was trained to what is available when the model is served. And, that, and we can also have uh, versions of packages managed properly. So you don't want to have an uncertainty. Uh, you include, a let's say, Pandas, right? Pandas changes. <laughs> It's not very backward compatible, right? So if you change your version of Pandas, you find that you can't, um, you know, maybe deserialize a model in production. So with the use of Docker images, we try to keep it static, so it's completely reproducible. I see. Yeah. Uh, and use it for your Hadoop, and and, and use the same um, environment for your Hadoop execution as well. So uh, you should take a look at that. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. So. Uh, I think as a follow-up, right? Oh, glad you mentioned Hadoop because that's that's what this conference is about. One of the things that we yeah. <laughs> core, right? But one of the things that I wanted to bring up was um, the um, we see several enterprise customers wanting to do training and batch scoring right on the Hadoop cluster. They are unwilling to or unable to move data out of the cluster and do training elsewhere. And we see a lot of um, uh, cases where even for compliance reasons they cannot move the data, right? So, um, in in your uh, practice, right? Do you see that kind of a requirement that you need to actually train and score right on the Hadoop uh, cluster, or do you find that it is actually uh, permissible for you to actually take the data and train it some train your model somewhere else? So in my previous experience, the challenge is that data scientists are always want to use their own tools, right? So sometimes, whether we like it or not, we are forced to. 
uh, sample data and then give it to them to train mostly SP, uh, SP SS, I believe. Um, so, the, but ideally, now I'm on, uh, in a new organization where we are centralizing everything. So that was the question. That's the reason why I asked the question. If I open up Zeppelin to the user base, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mostly what I see is that they are very much, uh, like you said, coders and clickers, right? Mm -hmm. So our hiring practice is mostly based upon the coders. But the challenge is that Zeppelin probably, I think uh, he was asking the same question. It's good for exploratory things, uh, but uh, the entire mo uh, model management, li life cycle management is not very, Zeppelin I don't think is uh, providing enough tool sets uh, to operationalize those things. So that's the one advantage of the Zeppelin embedded with Hortonworks itself, right? So bring all the processing to one central place. And we have with the GDPR and then compliance rules. It, it getting complicated to move the data around and enforce the same sec set of policies across different I islands. Yeah, I think he used a, a four letter word, right? GDPR, it's, it's, it scared us quite a bit when it started. Um, but um, I, I think, uh, you know, from, uh, from a DSX perspective, we've tried to build things that are complementary to uh, how these kinds of workloads run, especially with Zeppelin. So the idea is that you can actually train a model on Hadoop, um, and it can be managed, it can be governed, if you will, versioned inside of the data science experience environment. And that allows us to kind of share, uh, share the models, as well as uh, stand it up as a web service. And essentially, one of the aspects is you need to retrain models, right? Or you need to at least run evaluation or batch scoring. And you need to do that where the data is. So what Kanchana was talking about was an important example where we actually take the exact packages that we have and make it available in a, in a YARN environment. Right? So what happens is so the packages that you need are available. So you can actually run a, a batch job where the data is. So that makes it uh, faster. So you take analytics to data rather than bringing training uh, out of that. Right. So again, GDPR was a core reason why we had to do, do things like that. And also with HTTP3, you can support containers. So what it means is, let's say a TensorFlow or anything with all the Python libraries, you can just bring it, run inside, like where data is. Um, for a data scientist, how many are using Python versus other languages here? Mostly Python, right? Okay, how many are using others? R. R or Scala? Scala, okay. It's uh, interesting. I have a follow-up question on that. Mostly. Okay. <laughs> I see, okay. Yeah, got it. Got it, got it. Actually, actually, follow-up question was a good one. Uh, so, which version? So, who's still on Python 2.7? Oh, there, there, only one. Uh, all right. Everyone uh, is 3.5. And I'm assuming everybody else is in 3.5. Okay. 3.6. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Can I ask you a follow-up question? Yeah. Whoever is using Scala. So, I'm kind of curious because mostly whenever uh, we want people to. You, uh, standardized on one language because we're a central platform, mostly JVM based. Uh, there is a lot of pushback saying that, okay, Python is the universal standard for data science and all, but uh, do, do you see any uh, uh, functional disparity between what Scala offers and then uh, what Python offers? It does, and uh, we use multiple packages uh, for the applications and models we are building. Um, I'm, we're now part of VMware, uh, we built a cybersecurity solution, so we have 75 different models for various types of threats and other things, so it's a multi-language environment, and I think to your question around, you know, bringing data out for modeling, we have a challenge of actually getting that platform out to multiple customers. We don't co-mingle data across customers. 
And so in that case, it's even a bigger problem in terms of how do you actually make that information available. So what we have done is now virtualized our data science cluster for multiple teams to work with. Um, but to your point about uh, we do need uh, better support for uh, graph type of you know features, uh, distance measures, and you know multiple subgraphs, bipartite graphs, graph splicing. Uh, that is not available in all languages. So we have built some you know, stuff on our own. Scala uses that capability, uh, but clearly it depends on the types of you know features you are computing and the types of things you're interested in your model. I would say any application, you should probably be open to multiple languages. I mean, this is the world of you know, programming back in the days when you're doing assembly language programming, if people can relate to that. Um, and the world of uh, languages evolve. And if you see where you know, data science has evolved, um, it's sort of standardized in tabular data, but I think the next step is around other shapes of data. And so the mod, uh, the various scale libraries would need to evolve to support you know, new types of uh, shapes of data. Yeah, so I have a discussion with my statistician, I guess. And then she's kind of pointing out that a lot of the academic is still focusing on writing in R. And so a lot of new libraries start at R. And then from there on, people kind of translate it into Python and everything else. So it is good to have some understanding of, well, where do you get the latest libraries, right? And then try them out in, in our environment. And then after that, you think, oh, this is good. Let's standardize this and give it to the Python communities or whoever the next one is. So it's good to know what the, where's the benchmark, where's the, the places that doing those new different algorithm, new, new type of uh, how to optimize a certain math. Oh, sorry. Oh, R has its uh, limitations of being in memory, uh, which uh, thereby I asked the uh, IBM people, uh, is there any future to the big R that you had earlier? Uh, and bringing that forward, uh, bringing it out into uh, uh, the Hortonworks environment and making it part. Uh, or are there any other implementations of R that can handle can do the um, uh, use of disk as well as memory. Um, I'm not sure from a product perspective. I don't think Big R is, um, is going to be ported over to the Hortonworks um, platform yet. It might change uh, because we are also seeing a trend where um, instead of having one single large process that does this, there's also interest in distributing it. Right, so um, I know our, um, in Microsoft, right, uh, Revolution Analytics, they've done a lot of work over there. It hasn't, some of it hasn't shown up in open source, but it probably will. So I, I think that's more, um, more likely to happen than having something like Big R come back. Give Big R over to Hortonworks. And <laughs> <laughs> sure, oh, I, I think that, that might work out. Yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah, it's also, um, we also use R in other places, right? So the same kind of technology in, um, uh, let's say, our Netiza and now our um, um, Sailfish appliances, relational databases, relational warehouses. So we see the same kind of problems, and, and these are all clustered systems, right? So I think our uh, investments would probably be on the distributed case more than a single large R process. Yeah. Well, while, while I'm at that, I may as well ask about text analytics. <laughs> yeah, so um, Watson Explorer, which is our um, version of text analytics, is, is actually coming. Um, I mean, it is already out there but it is being better integrated into our data science stack. So the idea is that you could do text mining, for example, do things like sentiment analysis and use that to uh, feed in features for your uh, machine learning models. So th those kinds of, a deeper integration is coming, even though the products and functionality exist, it is not exactly 
easy to use uh, when you have two or three different products. So now we are more focused on bringing them together. And because, um, because data science experience by itself has a strong relationship with uh, HTTP, the Hortonworks data platform, we expect to be able to bridge that gap even better. So yeah, text analytics is getting a lot more attention again. Hey, my question is about uh, production support and sustainability of whether it's a Zeppelin job or a Spark job. We kind of get all excited and develop and train and test our model today. We deploy it to production. Um, I'm curious about your, vis your vision for the future in terms of we have a job that has been deployed, six months come by, nothing is breaking. We upgrade things, we patch environments, libraries deprecate. And you know, it's now a year or year and a half after my first deployment of the production environment. And I have people you know, kind of in infrastructure that are used to dealing with production issues, applications that deploy, they either work or don't work. But from an analytics point of view, my team being in analytics, I know that the, the typical DVAs or the application production support, if something breaks down on, a, on an application that I wrote, I'm going to be the next one that I'm going to have to be on call. So how do you assure portability of the, of the code that you develop and deploy today so that in the future also works or so that you don't become a slave of just upgrading your own scripts? Right. So I think you raise a uh, great point, right? And I'm happy to say that technology has reached a point where these problems are now uh, more elegantly solved, right? So our approach has been with, with data science experience and also with um, HTTP is to ensure that we can actually create uh, or use Docker images. So fundamentally, a Docker image represents uh, a state of all the packages that you need, and that can be replicated. In, in fact, um, it can be replicated as is because it's, it's, it can be archived and saved and can be used as is. So the idea is that if you don't need to upgrade your packages, Let's say uh, you want to ensure that the exact same set of packages, this exact same Python version is continuing to be used. You can do so. But at the same time, before you go through the extreme step of upgrading all your production environments, if you want to, let's say, do some point upgrades, maybe you want to upgrade from Python 2.71 to Python 2.72, you can actually because you can replicate these environments, you can actually test it safely, and you can roll it over to production only when you're satisfied. So those things are making it easier, right? Uh, I mean, these are generic, uh, you know, software engineering practices. But luckily for us, um, the industry has started uh, standardizing around these uh, Docker images and, you know, Kubernetes for orchestration and so on. So pretty soon, I'm hoping that. Um, we wouldn't. We would standardize on these practices. Thank you. And in HTTP 3.0, we support Spark in containers, in production. If you want to go do that. Excellent. Yeah, and 3.0 EA early access went out this June. If you're an existing customer, you can try it out. We're just opening for customers right now. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, one more. I have a question for myself. So. Did it go, Robert? You know? No, no. Okay. So, how many are we using like a deep learning GPUs today? GPU. Yeah. Slash. Of course, goes to deep learning. I guess who, who's who's actually doing you know deep workloads or trying them out, testing? Trying them out. Okay. okay. Only one. And and, uh, and is it is it TensorFlow? MXNet. MX. Big DL. Big DL. Okay, I Big heard about that before you mentioned. And and you sir, what what are you using? TensorFlow. Okay. I mean, why do you use Intel one versus TensorFlow? I'm just curious. We, we actually, our team went, our team went to um, uh, Keras with uh, TensorFlow backend okay. training and, um, you know, our current HDP installation, you know, I work in CPS Energy, our utility, you know, don't move just so quickly to the cloud to use any kind of infrastructure. Our infrastructure is very CPU centric, mm. and we were not quite ready to have all of the GPUs we wanted in our environment. And um, before we can move to the cloud, we have to demonstrate with what we have. 
and you know, being a CPU intensive um, operation in infrastructure, big DL is, is, is optimized for that, and our processors are Intel, happen to be. So it was uh, logical for us to kind of show uh, a preamble of how deep learning works to yeah. our um, top management so that they see the value in it. And then, you know, once you have the case demonstrated, then we can, uh, you know, grow from there. Got it. Okay. Then I'll ask. So TensorFlow also supports G CPUs also, right? Not just GPUs. So did you evaluate TensorFlow on CPU versus big DLs on CPUs? We have not checked the performance comparatives. Okay. Um, we just went to both of the trainings uh, on Keras as well as um, Keras training as well as um, you know big DL training, and we were convinced on the ease of use for big DL. Um, and um, in terms of the kernel, uh, the math kernel libraries that Intel has that allows quite a bit of uh, matrix operations that we wanted to get advantage of. I heard that. <laughs> I heard that Intel is working with Google to bring that to TensorFlow. Also, I'm not sure. So <laughs> I don't know how to figure. Yeah, I'm just curious. Yeah. So. Hopefully, I do know that uh, Big DL can, uh, you know, run uh, TensorFlow um, models. Right. So you can have your own training of models and the creation of models, and then once you're once you're ready for the deployment of the prediction, you can just run Big DL, you know, Tensor model, TensorFlow model in Big DL. Yeah. Yeah. We're a Spark shop, yes. Okay, uh, I'm I'm a little curious about um, you know training. You mentioned training. Um, where do you learn machine learning and deep learning techniques? You know, there. How do you decide what to use? I mean, do you have a uh, you know secret sauce here that you can share? So, um, for us, you know, we first start with what is all of the data that we have available um, because we don't have everything we would like to have, and then from there we just have some very basic practices on the 70-30% ratio of what to use for training, what to use for um, your, your testing. Um, from that point on, once you have a model that has been created, it's a matter of bringing the real-time information for um, kind of making the predictions live. Um, uh, so that's, I guess, the main point in terms of defining the length. The other thing is that our business is driven by weather patterns. And um, I went to Texas Tech to just study atmospheric sciences and weather. So we kind of look at what are the kind of the diurnal cycle or the seasonal um, cycle. And we just make sure that our data has enough representativeness of the changes that we want to be making predictions of um, in terms of that. So I guess I have one more question. As far as like, you know, so we have just two, two hands that were raised as far as deep learning. How many of you are actually or want to go into the, the deep learning and how many, you know, are just, you know, want to start or are you interested or, you know, so maybe just a raise of hand if anybody wants to go into that one, okay. So one, two, three. And the specific uh, environments is also you want to jump into TensorFlow, PyTorch, MXNet, or still just kind of figure it out? Just kind of okay. All right. So, so, so anybody um, uh, playing around with uh, auto ML kind of techniques, um, you know, um, because you know data science scientists are rare, right? So. Uh, <laughs> you said auto ML. Auto ML. Oh no, there are other techniques in open source as well, but uh, like H two driverless AI and things like that have come out. There are quite a number of algorithms. Just curious if uh, you've tried that out as a way to automate so some of your experiments. So parameter tuning, many of yeah. those things that are there relevant, like hyperparameter tuning or just finding the, the best hyperparameters. Anybody, anybody going at space, anybody uh, you know, using these techniques? Wow. Interesting, OK. Uh, so if, uh, if there was one thing that would make your um, you know, day-to-day -day work easier, right? How would you, let's say you're a data scientist or you work with data scientists, what do you think that there is this one little thing that would make them extremely productive? What, what are their pain points, basically? What, what are they struggling with? At least for uh, my team in San Antonio, is kind of going through the performance tuning, um, still painful. 
Um, we don't have the, the, the feedback loops yet built in a way that is automated, such as you know, IBM DSX offers uh, that kind of easy to, 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 to fine tune kind of thing. Um, we are not quite ready and mature to bring IBM DSX as a company, because you know, there is a price associated to all of these things. Um, and we, we think that there is quite a bit of, of an opportunity for the open source community to make Spark, you know, fine tuning because since this, you know, the Spark history server is logging all of this information, I think that, um, you know, there should be low hanging fruit for us to optimize, but so far still painful. Got it. And, and how many of our using products like Unravel, Pepper Data to tune Spark clusters? You seen what? Pepper no. Data, Unravel, no, no one? Yeah, so performance monitoring. For like that, yeah. application performance monitoring, yep. okay. Pepper data. Yeah. And, um, okay, that's fine. But, but uh, so, so I guess be, beyond this, is, is there like, do you see also a need for those kind of application performance monitoring tools uh, in what you're doing? You, you do, right, okay. Like Spark, my job didn't finish, or you know, there's a problem with CPU, but it might be Yarn problem. It's like a distributed system, right? You don't know where it's coming from. So you, can I get a raise of hand how many guys will use it if we have a product like that? Okay. <laughs> he is really strong, okay. Yeah, he's like, ah, yeah. okay, all right. Two hands. Yeah. That's good. Come on, it's only six, uh, 20. Um, okay, and one question. Again, when we're doing our training ourselves, one thing I found out, again, I'm, we're not, I'm not a data scientist. I, deep learning models are like black box. We have no idea what's going on inside, right? What do you guys use to today to visualize or debug those models? Like, what's wrong with the models? Like, we're not sure it's the data quality or it's it's the model, right model. Like, what do you guys what do you guys do today? So for us, we, so you have the. So I guess we we're really focused on two main things. Is the one is the optimization routine that is is used and the monitoring of that or the quick you know display of. Your, your optimization method and how it is converging. So matplotlib does it for us. We Mat very quickly kind of visualize. Okay, oh, map, map, matplotlib. Matplotlib okay, is what is we use to kind of focus on the optimization routines. Got it, got it. Um, and then time stamping things. Okay. But um, um, on the accuracy, that's a separate story. Do you have the right architecture in place? And right. how do you go through the different multiple iterations? How many neurons, how many layers? Mm. That's still very much an iterative process. I see. Um, where we just scale up, hmm. and with the price you have to pay for waiting, um, <laughs> uh, given that, but you know, you see your accuracy, you're still measuring your, your target versus your, your, predict your, your prediction, still okay. the, you know, the error metrics that apply to standard forecasting techniques, at least for us. You know, we measure accuracy uh, in terms of RMSC or MAP, for example, and um, we just play with different architectures until we find one that is most optimal for us. I see, got it. Training can be for a couple of days, yeah. mm -hmm. wow. and then we would be kind of reducing. If uh, we we cannot be as ambitious as we as we would like to be, we would be scaling back and adjusting accordingly to the infrastructure that we have today. So, uh, so other way to evaluate the the model in a production or whether the model in a training. <coughs> so most of the TensorFlow that has a tensor board. Mm -hmm. So that will allow us to do a, a context writing so you can evaluate all the input variables on the images mm. on the activations. Mm. So, I mean, it's everything in a real time. When you train your model and your model is not doing well, you can evaluate your loss functions and you can write your custom functions to evaluate how your model is performing with respect to your data. So when you once you have your baseline model, then you have to look for your performance in such a way that whether the loss function is behaving as per your expectation. Mm -hmm. If not, okay, let's filter out all false positives or false negatives and run, run those images through the network and debug each layer. So on the layer, if you see any of the layer is like, the activation is like, let's say uh, you are detecting a dog versus cat. If you see uh, a photo is manipulated, a dog with a uh, cat face, definitely it's a it's it's an error with the data. So you need to look for okay. So this activation is causing this. You got to like backtracking from your activations. I mean, from your loss functions, from your activations, from your data. 
So if there is an error with the data, then it's difficult to, I mean, let's say your 50% of your training data is like error, then that is useless of work or correcting your training data. Instead of that, check your test data. If you see there is an error or improve your test data, so your model will adapt to correct your training data. So you don't have to correct, you don't have to modify your training data. I mean, like, make, make your training data is 100% quality. That is not a necessary. If your dev, I mean, validation data set and your test data set is 100% is valid with a, with a human error is close to zero, then even if your training data set is 80% is data quality and 20% has, has an error, then still you can build your better model. Um, judge the quality of your test data. That's based on the business metrics, right? Uh, so, so definitely, uh, in, when we when we start from a scratch, we'd never know the the target level. So the the business people, like the business audience, they will say, okay, this is my target. Let's say identifying an object. If we are doing an object detection, okay, this is my targeted object. So we will get uh, some sample data, like starts with hundred images start your baseline model, then use your baseline model to label it again, produce your training data. So like, starts with 100, baseline model, evaluate your model, label it again, uh, use your model to label 500 additional images. So now you, are, now you have your uh, 600 data quality, uh, 600 images with high data quality. Now train in another model. So it's like, you don't have to, you don't have to have a labeler to label all your thousands or 10,000 images, that's taking time, and you cannot move your model into a production. If you have, if we have a one week of deadline, no, that's not at all possible. Human resources consuming, and you have to spend a lot of time. So no one, even a business person, they don't want to label more than 100 images. So if they have a time, they will say hardly no. I have came across a scenario. All the business people, they will say when when I ask, okay. Could you please produce me uh, 500 images? They will say no. Even if it is a text, I'll asking, okay, this is my text file. Uh, like if I'm doing a, a sequence modeling or sentiment analysis, okay, could you please produce me some thousand records? They will say no. So they don't want, they don't want to spend time. Instead of that, uh, getting 100 images with high data quality is feasible. So they are ready to do that, but they don't want to do that for 1,000. So what we do usually, uh, you got 100 images, then train a baseline model, produce your 500 images, the prediction, then do a data quality, compare that with your test data, and send that 600, send that 500 predicted images to the business people. Hey, do you have some time? Could you please go to uh, all these, go through all the images, and if there is an any error, yeah, they can do that in a, less than a minutes. Okay, then now I have a 600 images. Now I can optimize my model. I can increase my training data size. When I have a concrete thousand images with the high quality or high data quality, okay, I'm good to train, I'm good to evaluate or experiment any architecture. So that's how uh, we do start small, okay. start small and, and iterate it and end up with a big, big one. No, like video analysis, uh, video analysis and image analysis. And, and uh, sometimes we do with uh, a sensor data. Gotcha. So fair to say that most of you work with sample data initially? Yep. So, so that's, that's what the, roughly will you say is a fair size? You're saying 100? Uh, I mean, for images, uh, generating 100, you can you have uh, different techniques to overpopulate it. OK, you can use uh, the 100 images. You can you do a data augmentation to produce that into uh, some 10,000 images. So and if you see that if your model is overfitting, then that, then you have to stop doing data augmentation. Mm -hmm. Then that, then you have to add more real-time data. Sorry, just curious about data. Um, how much data cleaning do you guys have to do in order to get it to the point? And from what you're saying is that sometimes you don't even get the quality data that you want, right? So how do you go about making sure that you have a good set of data for your training? Uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's not, uh, I mean, uh, so we cannot just get a quad data, high quality data in a, in a first, first attempt. Mm -hmm. So 
have been the minimum four or five attempts and like sending back between the business people and myself like okay now that is a data quality error they'll say no this 100 percentage quality then what i would do is like okay let's pull up all the false positive and false negative and provide the evidence that okay this image is not data quality because of you labeled this as a x but the model predicting that as an y because of this activation so they will agree that okay that's my fault okay it could be uh, i mean it's in a first attempt we cannot get a high quality data so and we never know whether the, the data is have data is a quality one or not so until we evaluate your, our uh, model loss function and evaluate your uh, uh, like false positives and false negatives So for a lot of folks who are working with text data would have visualization tools, right? So for the non-text kind of data, what do you guys do? Uh, so I remember you mentioning about having to go through each and every image to identify whether it's right or wrong, but what are what do you typically look at from, you know, your visualization tools are almost nil. Yep. So yeah. is, it, is it manually inspecting? So you're limited by the size of the data? Uh, you mean uh, you debugging the the model results? Yeah, just to know the quality of the data, right? Yeah, we have to go through the images. There's no other way. Uh, or we can uh, we can I mean in a more advanced way we can find uh, similarity checking like any images like convert your images into a vectors. Then you can see okay, this image is an error. Then find all the images which is similar to this. Then you can filter out all the similar images. Then you can just evaluate the target label then you can easily identify the false false labeled <coughs> images then compare to a uh, quality one and it's basically just two categories right like something's wrong with this image yeah okay. yeah i mean we cannot say that it's two category like if you are doing a multi class classification let's say you are doing a object detection of identifying different objects then an image will be like uh, i mean let's say if you are identifying a, a human being a truck and a cat for the human being on track could be labeled properly, but for the cat, it could be wrong. But on a high level, it's, it's whether the label is correct or not. It's a binary. That's it. Yep, yep. Even sometimes we, I mean, uh, we, we will try to uh, try to hack the model by introducing uh, false positives. Mm -hmm. We want to see, okay, whether this model is doing good or not. We know there is a false positive in the test set, but we want to know whether the model is doing good or not. But I, I mean, there are sometimes you, you don't believe that your model will, will, will really doing good on identifying those false positives. Uh, if that is only possible if you have your, uh, uh, like, uh, a good quality training data. And are you working with GAN? No, 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 I haven't. I mean, we haven't tried it, but um, GAN is an, it's the best way to, ge to generate your data. Like, let's say you have just 100, 100 images of high quality one, yeah, you can go with the GAN to generate the images, but there are more chances that uh, your model will, can be ha hacked. Mm -hmm. Like, producing an image is, uh, like, like, if you, like, you can go through the activations, produce an images which is similar to the activation images. Now you can send that to your model. Definitely, your model will predict, uh, even though there are there is nothing with just an activation functions. It will evaluate. Okay, this is a good prediction, but you don't see that the model, the image is a valid image. I think I learned more today than uh, <laughs> what I contributed, but thanks. Um, so, so maybe just uh, discuss a little bit about the vision on how much you know, could you know, reveal, you know, reveal sure. about the vision of where we're going and then see if that's sort of, you know, if that's what you are expecting to with so that can give you some feedback. So, so sort of just talking about the I, I want them to sort of talk and discuss about the vision, you know, like Sumitra, uh, you know, discussing you know, a big announcement that we can do reporting right now, so that's great for, for deep learning use cases, yeah. and then where you guys are DSX, maybe? Yeah. Sure. Like the exactly. So, you yeah, know, that yeah. should, you want to, again, hear about like, that. Like two years from now, yeah. how it's going to change. Right. So, our uh, mission with um, data science experience is to enable different kinds of frameworks and tooling 
um, make data scientists a lot more productive, yet bring some governance and control over uh, taking your models to production, as well as, and sometimes it's not just about models, right? It's, we are also looking at analytics in general. So you may have some supporting capabilities. You may be building a shiny app that you want to deploy, and at the same time as a model to support the model or your use cases. So our focus is to um, enable the consumption of uh, open source, as well as IBM's own uh, um, uh, heritage products. So things like SPSS is being uh, expanded, uh, text analytics, text mining is being expanded. We uh, we are working on some um, uh, techniques. So, for example, if you have heard of the Fiddle project, it was just recently announced. It's um, it's a framework for deep learning. Uh, it's an open source project. So we are ha we have people from our IBM research and from our open source teams contributing to that. So, from a product perspective, engineering perspective, we are looking at data science experience to enable that, as well as from a um, production perspective, right? Enterprises need um, governance, enterprise need to fit into uh, compliance uh, regulations. So we are trying to look at how we could help them do that. Uh, we r also realize that there are a lot of uh, tools and choices, and we just need to make sure that uh, we can help you become more productive in those areas. Uh, we are looking at things like um, um, catalogs and governance catalogs and indexes that can help you do certain things much more efficiently. For example, if you if you are trying to look at, let's say there is a regulation um, in um, in your state that says that um, uh, certain discriminatory practices are not allowed. And if you, I mean, just like GDPR, right? There is, these things are just around the corner. You start looking at, are you allowed to use these two features together? Are you allowed to use um, age and uh, estimated income? to decide on, uh, together, to decide on credit risk or loan acceptance. Maybe there are some rules that come in and say, you can't use these two together, but you can use one or the other, right? Now, if such a rule comes in, how will you identify all your models that, that rely on these two features? So we are looking at some scenarios where we can actually help um, uh, enterprises deal with such compliance and regulations in addition to you know, becoming better productive with their use of open source and IBM technologies. Sri, I'm one. Uh, how do you spell that open source project? I gotta, I gotta check it out. F F D L. F D L. F F F F D L. Uh, framework for deep learning. Ah, okay, great. Wow. Thank you. Uh, you. You can also look at things like Kubeflow, K U B E Flow. K U B E. Okay. Flow. So those are recent. Q-Flow, TensorFlow, okay. No, it's, it's <laughs> a framework for helping you use yeah. TensorFlow. I'm happy you spelled it out because I actually searched for Fiddle, mm -hmm. and there is an integrated deep learning framework, which is called DeepRest. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. Huh. All right. So this is FFDL. 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 Okay. So one more question before I, I answer Robert's question. How many of you are using Spark for streaming, Spark streaming? Oh, Use case, okay. So, um, from a Spark side, we are the platform, right? Uh, HDP. So, Spark is becoming a Swiss Army knife doing everything, right? ETL, SQL, <laughs> Spark streaming. Um, so, for us, at hard and work, Spark SQL, we aren't looking at that much, mostly because we are using Hive as a SQL engine. However, for Spark streaming and Spark ETL, we're going to spend a lot of time. Uh, Spark Stream is going to be our kind of streaming engine going forward. And for ETL, one thing we're running into is a lot of data engineers. They complain about my Spark job didn't finish in time. I have problems here, but it turned out to be yarn, C group issues, right? I, I debug for one month, two months. We're going to spend some time maybe looking at some APM solutions. So that's one thing we're looking at. Um, and in terms of deep learning, now we support containers, right? So what it means is uh, I can support Spark with all these things in the container as well. I can also bring third-party TensorFlow. If you already have it, I can bring it to it. Again, we're not going to support it right away like this, but we also have a tech review going out to see at least 
get a feel for the market demand. So really, for uh, Spark ETL, Spark Streaming, Deep Learning, we're gonna spend some time. And we are also gonna support GPU pooling. In HTTP3, I can support GPU isolation and pooling. It means if we have two cards in a machine, I can give the two cards to two data scientists versus one hogging everything. Then I can also, I mean, you're familiar with that, and one can also be like, I can pull all the GPUs across all the clusters, sorry, all, across all the nodes in a cluster, pull them as a one resource, and expose a yarn queue. Today, what I see is a lot of customers, they create a separate GPU cluster, move the data, do all this. We'll do her because of four letter words, it's not possible. So we're gonna fix all those things with yarn GPU pulling. So really high level, that's what we're thinking at a, at a very top level. Okay, there's one more question here. Um, so I'm kind of asking you guys for advice. Um, I myself, and uh, I'm a physicist, and uh, recently my research work has been applying uh, machine learning techniques to uh, study uh, like quantum materials. Um, uh, so my two recent publications uh, uh, that one using supervised machine learning and the other one unsupervised machine learning uh, to predict the phases of uh, quantum materials. Um, and I got like around 80 citations for those. Um, so my question is kind of like, um, uh, what's the way that I can transfer my uh, skills to like the industry? Uh, yeah, like, uh, yeah, I'm kind of looking for new opportunities and how do I transfer my skills as a physicist and, uh, you know, to the industry. Right, right. I think the problem is one is the domain knowledge, right? Other one is the science part of data science, right? How do you combine this together? Uh, I think that's what we're asking. Um, you want to take that? Uh, I can try, you know. Uh, <laughs> so... Um, one way to look at it is to see that, um, you know, whatever science that your field that you're working on, if you can f have a formalization of the problem that you're dealing with, right? And the second part is to uh, uh, gather your data, right? So data is something that everybody can understand, right? It could be images, it could be structured, unstructured, it could be numbers, but as long as you can formalize it, you can formalize your problem, you can formalize um, or at least even put some structure and metadata around your data, that actually helps you proceed to the next step. And then you'll start, I, I mean, the reason why machine learning has gotten popular is because you can use the same algorithms to apply it to various different fields. But the first aspect of trying to formalize uh, what your problem is, what you're trying to achieve in the first place, and having access and organizing your data, I feel that that would go a long way into understanding it. And second, your experience in, in going through that process, right? How did, you, um, how did you pick the algorithms that you picked, right? And what, what kind, how did you understand your data? How do, whether, you had it, uh, whether you did, um, uh, shall we say, a further analysis of your data, you explore your data, you understood your data distributions, that itself, right, those, those are uh, tribal knowledge, you know, domain knowledge. You understand the data, even though it's maybe bits and bytes. Uh, that, I don't know if you can codify it, but perhaps you can, uh, you know, publish those steps. And that might be a one way to look at it. So, um, but other than that, I mean, I can't help you there. I mean, other thing, again, I don't have a lot of experience myself, but one thing I've seen is when I went through our own self-driving car expert, like, experiment, right, internally, I saw them, all the models are open source. Like, it's go to GitHub, get it. Uh, it doesn't rocket science there. Um, what makes a difference is the right data and if the problem in, in the model, what's, where the problem is. Is my data problem something else? So I really realized it's mostly the domain knowledge is more important and the science part, the data science piece becoming, it's open source out there. You have to keep trying to apply to your own domain. And then I think it requires some set of little Python script knowledge, I think, but 
I don't think you need to be a super data scientist to apply to your field. That, that's the feeling I got. What do you guys think? So, so maybe I'll just make a comment. So, you know, one thing that I've seen a lot of people that are entering this field is like, where do I get started? And there's a fantastic amount of resources. Like you could take Andrews in Coursera on mis yeah, machine yeah. learning, then exactly. deep learning. Of course, you could always come to my crash course just to get started. Uh, we have yes, yes, that's <laughs> <right>? good. <laughs> I'm just pitching myself. We have, of course, you know, great training courses uh, as well. But then I think you know, just like you know, Sumitra just was experienced experimenting with the self-driving car and learn a ton just in the process. You could go and uh, and, uh, and join like a Kaggle competition. Just choose one of them. Then naturally, the teams evolve, and you just learn by doing, right? And I think that's one way, and it's a fantastic process. Yeah. I think I will uh, make a comment. I think it's sort of tied to your question around testing and test data sets and other things. The, and I'm speaking from an unsupervised learning space. There's a lot of models being built. But 80% of the work in building a good model in the world of unsupervised learning is understanding the data, profiling uh, characteristics, and also building your three collections, your training, your sort of you know validation and test data sets and the types of features that matter to a particular problem space. So I think when you build something and you you know how did you go about actually and I use this no um, with no offense I use this term it's hard to make a data scientist think like a software engineer in terms of value of unit testing and everything. So I manage both data scientists as well as engineers and platform teams. Um, that is the place where I like to have my data scientist write a journal about what he or she saw about the data, the actual profiling of the information there. How did you actually pick the features that eventually matter, right? You go through a journey of trying different features and eventually throwing out 90% of the features you have and eventually agreeing on you know, the, the final set. And then also looking for you know things to test at in production. Uh, when I'm running my models in production, how are my models performing? Uh, can I build some metrics into that so that you know with one month of the models in production and enough uh, you know, trying out with real world data set, can I see how good my models are performing? And what can I do to improve? Maybe my features are not good enough, or I need to improve something, and working through that. So as part of your sort of building up the model and the skills that you have, I think sharing some of that knowledge in the form of a simple blog and journal. I, I ask my data scientists to actually talk about it every week, to take a data set that they have seen and tell me the story of the data and you know, share what you found and how did you find it and things like that. That's a lot of things. And then I would say for Hortonworks also to host perhaps a Atlas instance where people can bring these data sets and share test data sets and actually not just put it into the catalog with some tags and other things, but really write the blog around the data and tell the story out of the data because the science of feature engineering will be the next wave of uh, how data science will evolve. And feature engineering is still at an early stage today. So that would be my suggestion. That's a really good one. Come up. Um, so I, I guess like my actual questions was like, uh, I have the knowledge in machine learning, um, uh, but my background, I'm a physicist and I learn um, like programming by myself, I learned Fortran, Python, uh, MATLAB all by myself. So, so I don't really have uh, the background as like, you know, the computer scientist, you know? Um, so uh, I know how to get things done, but I might not have the skill that um, uh, like a CS guy has. Uh, and I learned also. I also learned machine learning by myself, um, including by building the fully uh, connected neural network library from scratch. And then uh, I train it to locate the uh, temperature at which uh, the mathematical model of uh, ferromagnets uh, 
changes faces um, up to 99% accuracy. Uh, so that's the that's like one of the way I get started with machine learning, and and right after that I use it uh, on my research project. And like in three months, uh, we got the paper up archive. Um, so I think like uh, it's not. It, it's not that hard for me to learn something. It's just that I'm finding it hard to find opportunity in the industry. That's like, I guess that's kind of like what I'm trying to say, because um, like uh, I know how to solve problems, but how do I uh, like compete with people from the CS engineering? <laughs> yeah, but I, I don't think it's it's competition, yeah. right? So to your point, right, where you say you have your data scientists explain certain things, I think um, I, speaking as a software engineer, right, um, I'm kind of envious with your skills, right? You have really good domain knowledge that I can never get. Right? I totally agree with that. Uh, yeah. So, but where software engineers can actually help is to kind of fine tune things, right? They can take your model to production, ensure that there's a software engineering engineering process to it. And while you could focus on the problems that need to be solved, and machine learning is actually making things very democratic, right? You don't need a, a PhD in computer science to do anything, right? Uh, so I think that's actually very good, right? And things like Python are making it useful. But what I feel is that software engineers can complement and um, like blogs or some storyboarding around how you are uh, looking at the problem can actually help uh, software engineers catch up um, and then kind of take your um, your uh, your results right or your output to production right and they can run it in scale they can do it um, they can hook it up to you know streaming applications they can hook it up to wherever things are needed and that's where uh, software engineers can help but I, I don't think it's a competition. Um, I, I'll add one thing, and um, I mentor about 65 students when I was faculty at University of Texas, and my advice to you is you just have to hustle, just like everybody else. <laughs> and you need to network with people that can see the value that you can bring and how you can actually solve problems. So you're doing that today, but probably this community here, we're all on the same category, hustling. Um, and um, so you need to network with other folks that are not like us. Um, that's number one. Number two is you need to be able to communicate um, with the people that is going to help you, the software engineers and computer sciences that are going to help you to deploy those models to production. You need to be very effective in communicating with them, which means that you need to learn some of the things that they know today. You don't need to be an expert, but download, for example, HDP, Hortonworks Sandbox. Go through the process of getting that up and running. Interface with the Linux operating system command and make sure that you can apply your Python knowledge in that sandbox. In a, in, in, that diversity is so rich. You are not going to become an expert in the CS side, but you're going to be so effective communicating your knowledge with them so that you empower the whole organization around you. I just just one comment. Really love that pitch, and uh, you know uh, myself and Raphael over there. We're part of the community team. We publish these send boxes, so definitely go for it. And we do high. We try to do really high quality tutorials, so definitely try that. That's a very very good journey. Thank you. That's a great advice. All right, one last one. Yeah. So one more thought on that. Yeah. So definitely these conferences and all this Hadoop and open sources is going to help enable you to do your work. Your domain knowledge is definitely the key. Understanding what is this related. For example, so you're doing, um, I guess, um, uh, quantum physics areas, right? I would assume. And then, so we have, for example, we have people who does metrologies, right? We measure materials, characteristics. So there's the relations in yours versus ours in some of the areas. But we also have other group that does measuring other stuff. So, so for example, you just have to figure out in your domain knowledge, do you have some type of a relationship with another domain that you can actually bring on board and have that discussion? So oil, for example, there are people who actually measure the characteristics of oil and chemicals pro properties again. So being able to establish your linkage between your domain. So we, are, I'm a system engineering kind of, kind of guy. So I'm kind of like a system engineering with a data science background support now. <laughs> That's like, like a 
now I can talk to computer engineer, I can talk to my statisticians. That, that help us to kind of build up the domain areas that each person be able, be able to talk to and be able to kind of, kind, of, kind of like a graph database for me. So I can see that, oh, okay, you guys are using this type of properties, so your system models or your engineering models have to be related in some this way. So let's use this type of data to test first and maybe your technique is actually directly applied to it or maybe certain things may just require some little bit of tingling. And then if you want to go into financial analysis to high velocity trading, <laughs> there's definitely different areas where you can actually also apply. It's just that you don't want to go directly to that route and say, hey, bank, hire me. Because you don't know the, the relationship yet between your system models. That's, that's the thing you need. Yes. So as someone else that actually did the physics path on this, the reality is that you nailed it when you said that you, you're a compliment to them and you're never going to compete with a computer scientist because you're going, you are the R&D at the start of it. I mean, think about, think about what physics has done outside of physics, the physics world in the last 30 years. 25-ish years ago, you, um, the financial sector hired the physicists to put those al algorithms together that eventually bankrupted the market. But in between, you know, they, uh, they, they did the first version of it and then someone else came along and made a much better version of it down the line. Um, six years ago, no one really knew what they were doing with data science, but they realized that they got a lot of good results from physicists, so they started hiring a bunch of physicists. Nowadays, a physicist can't get that job because you need the actual domain-specific knowledge. So a lot of physics at the end of the day is they're hiring you when they don't know what they need yet, but they know that you, someone that can solve a smart problem. And when it comes to a lot of this stuff, it's you're going to make that first version of the model, like I've done this more than once in one way or another, that you make the version that it's not pretty and is not fast, but it gets the right answer, and you give it to somebody else who's really good at it, and they give you the right, they get it some to where someone can actually use it. Yeah, their job is to optimize whatever you have. Yeah, that, that was a great answer. By the way, do they still call them quants, or as that, you know, is, you know? Still, still quants? Okay, that's interesting. All right, guys. With that, we're almost at the top of the hour. We're going to wrap it up. Thanks a lot for attending. Um, big uh, round of applause for our panelists for, for the time. Um, and, uh, and yeah, see you tomorrow.